Hi, Econ students. This is video 4.3. We're talking price discrimination. Actually, I already recorded this video over the weekend and it did not upload. So apologies. We're going to try this again. Hopefully I can make it shorter and maybe a little bit better. So let's go. So up until this point, we said that firms can't price discriminate, at least monopolies can't, because right, it's not fair to charge one person a higher price than somebody else. And we use that as a rationale for why marginal revenue is less than demand. Because if I want to attract more customers into my business, I have to lower price. But I have to lower price for everybody, not just that next customer, right? So what if price discrimination actually could happen? What's that look like? Well, we know it does happen. We actually have examples of it in our own society. So if price discrimination can happen, what are the conditions that have to be in place for that to happen? And then what does that monopoly look like? Is it different? than a normal monopoly that does not price discriminate. So let's get into it. What is price discrimination, you might ask? It's a practice of selling the same good to different people at different prices. The goal is to sell everybody the product at the highest, at the highest possible price or the price they are willing to pay. In other words, remember consumer surplus is the difference between what I'm willing to pay and what I actually pay, right? I might be willing to pay $100 for a Chipotle burrito, but I only have to pay eight. So that $92 difference, that's my consumer surplus. Well, price discrimination says, well, if you're willing to pay $100, we're going to try our best to charge you $100 so that you have a consumer surplus of zero. You're not mad because you're willing to pay that, and we make maximum profit. Every firm wants to price discriminate if they can because they want to maximize their profitability. Uh, examples that we have in our economy, airline tickets, we talked about this in class, are common price discrimination. Stadiums often use price discrimination. Uh, car, the auto industry uses price discrimination, except on new cars, but definitely on used cars because there's a little bit of mystique there, uh, right? Exactly what is this worth? And we try to make blue books, but it doesn't necessarily tell us what the actual value of, a, of an individual car is. And so when we have certain conditions in place, price discrimination can occur and we can charge different people different prices for identical or very similar products or services. So again, price discrimination, try to charge every single consumer what they're willing to pay, which means that profits will be much higher and consumer surplus will cease to exist because everybody pays what they're willing to pay. There's no difference between what I pay and what I'm willing to pay. Okay. So what conditions are necessary to be able to price discriminate? First, a firm has to have monopoly power, right? You can't price discriminate unless you're the only place that is providing that good. Even if you're the only place providing that good on that day, you still have monopoly power in that moment. It's like being a water salesman in a desert, right? If people show up to you, you're the only one around, you have monopoly power. You must be able to segregate the market as well. A common segregation technique is first come, first serve. So whoever gets here first pays a certain price. And then when we have fewer remaining, we might start pushing that price up. Another way to do it is kind of reverse that and say, hey, we're going to have a very low price early on. And if you're only willing to pay that very low price, you're going to get up at 5 a.m. on Black Friday. And then at 6 a.m., that price is going to change to a higher price. And some people are then going to be clicked into the market and they're going to go out and buy it then. And then later on, we're going to have a higher price, et cetera, et cetera. And so as time moves on, you click into a group of people that are only willing to pay or that are willing to pay a higher price and are willing to sacrifice convenience to do that. Right. So those are several ways that you can segregate the market. We do that with airline tickets by saying, hey, you know, you can get it through this website or this website. And some of them have guarantees and some of them don't. Some are in aisle seats and some of them are, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then consumers must not be able to resell the product. This is important. If they could buy it from you at one price and sell it at another price, then it uh, completely undercuts all of your profitability as a result and ruins your marketplace. But that's price discrimination. It does exist when those conditions are in place, when you can segregate the market, you have inordinate power over price, and consumers are not able to resell your product. You just might be able to charge people what they're willing to pay instead of what they want to pay, which are two different things. So what's this look like on a chart? Well, you might remember this, right? At $11, this firm can sell zero goods. Let me get rid of this real quick. Oops. So in order to attract the first worker, come on, there we go. Why won't you go away? 
There we go. Okay. So in order to check the first worker, they have to lower the price to $10. So when they lower the price to $10, one individual is willing to buy that good. Sweet. So the marginal revenue is $10. Now, if they want to attract a second one, maybe they want to sell a second good, they know somebody is willing to pay nine. So they lower the price to $9. When they lower the price to $9, they gain a new customer. But notice they don't have to sell it for $9 to everybody. They sell the first good for 10. They sell the second one for nine. So instead of their total revenue being 18, if they sold both goods for $9, it's 19. And instead of their marginal revenue going from 10 to eight, it goes from 10 to nine, just like price. Let's check that out again. Let's say they want to lower the price again to attract another customer. So when they do, they attract a third buyer with a price of $8. Now, again, before, when a firm can't price discriminate, they'd have to charge $8 to everybody, right? Lower the price for everybody. But because this firm has certain conditions in place, they charge the first person $10, the second person $9, and the third person $8. So the total revenue is $27. Marginal revenue went from $10 to $9 to $8, just like price or demand that went from 10 to nine to eight. You should be starting to see a theme here. If they do it again, they lower the price to $7. They don't have to lower the price to $7 for everybody just for the fourth individual. And so they sell the first for 10, the second for nine, the third for eight, the fourth for seven, which gives us a total revenue of 34, a marginal revenue of seven. So again, marginal revenue went from 10 to nine to eight to seven, just like my price went from 10 to nine to eight to seven. Right? Fill in the rest and look at what you got. You have your marginal revenue and your price or demand. Remember, price and quantity represent or create demand are completely equal. They are exactly the same. They are no longer segregated. Mr. Darp lives. MR and D are going to be united. Let's take a look at this on a graph. Oh, there you go. So when price discriminating firms, marginal revenue equals demand. Okay. So you know this is a price discriminating or a non-price discriminating monopoly. This is a regular monopoly. We know that because marginal revenue is decreasing at a greater rate than demand. That's what indicates that. They are separate. There are two curves. However, when we price discriminate, marginal revenue goes away and becomes equal to demand. So we only have one downward sloping curve. It is both demand and marginal revenue, which means now I'm going to produce where demand equals marginal cost or where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That same thing exists, right? Notice demand is equal to sneaky supply. We are producing the socially optimal quantity for the society. In other words, we are allocatively efficient for quantity. But what about price? Well, we actually have no price. We don't dash over to get the price. Remember, everybody is paying a different price. So this entire green area here, above average total cost, right? Because that's gonna be my total cost right there, dash up to ATC. All of this, this trapezoid here is all going to be profit. Why? Because we have infinite profitability because we are charging people the maximum price they're willing to pay because we can perfectly price discriminate. Now, is there any deadweight loss? No, there's actually no deadweight loss because we're producing the socially optimal quantity. So big takeaway, price discriminating results in several prices, not just one. It results in more profit. Notice there is no consumer surplus because everybody is paying what they're willing to pay. And we're actually producing a higher quantity than we would have as a normal monopoly. And it's a socially optimal quantity. So astronomical prices for monopolies as a result of this. But remember, you can only price discriminate if you have certain conditions in place. If you have monopoly power, you're able to segregate the market in some legal way. And then finally, you're able to prevent the resell of your product or service. Okay, friends, that's it. This says quiz 4.1. Don't worry about that. Uh, that We are done with all the concepts for 4.1. But your Khan Academy is posted for you. So please take that and I will see you in class where we will dig into this a little bit deeper.